we will be. Thanks for the reminder. Uh, welcome to Eastern Town Hall, a Kadana Communities Initiative. Um, welcome to the experiment. <laughs> uh, as you know, things may break, lack documentation or alter between iterations, uh, but we're doing our best and this is our team. Uh, we have a team from Vietnam. We, Mi will join us shortly. I'm from East Africa, and we have Are you coming in from Indonesia? Hi, Are you? Would you like to say hello? Hello, everybody. Hello, Angela. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Okay, I'm good. Thank Welcome you very much. Indonesia. You guys are, are coming through today. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Are you from Indonesia? Uh, selamat datang kepada teman-teman juga yang dari Indonesia. Selamat datang di Eastern Hemisphere Town Hall. Terima kasih. Thank you, Angela. Would anyone like to um, say hello in their language from Vietnam? Xin chào, xin chào. Hey, hey, Donnelly. Who else is here? Vietnamese. <laughs> yeah, it's a Vietnamese to say hello. Hello? Hey, hey, hello? Okay. Xin chào. Yeah. Tian. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi Angela. Uh, hi. Uh, xin chào tất cả mọi người. Xin chào mọi người, mọi người đã đến với uh, phòng họp của Eastern Town Hall uh, vào uh, hai tuần một lần vào uh, buổi chiều sáng uh, buổi chiều thứ bảy. Uh, thank you Angela. Um, thank you everyone. Uh, I return to you uh, Angela. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, next slide, please. Utah. Thank you. Hello, Utah. And hello, thank you. Domo, eto, Higashi Hanky meet up, eh, Yukso, Irashemsta, eto, and my two and Hono, this name, eh, Sanki Sama, no, Sunday, Uyo, Kiba, nine days, Kerry, the more, eh, Kono, eh, Kode, this name, eto, Mahanaswa, the Fund Hachi, isn't project machine to the Fund Q. で、こういう風にえっと、ま、あの、提案をしますよだったりとかですね。ま、そういうものをですね、えっと、日本のコミュニティにですね、え、LINE え、ちょっとこの後になるんですけど、あの、この後別、しかも別、ちょっと別のリンクなんですけど、あの、プル、えっと、POL ですね。POL え、やってください。私もですね、そこに行ってですね、もしちょっと英語が難しいなっていう場合はあのサポートできますのでお願いします。Thank you. Thank you, Yuta. Thank you and welcome everyone from Japan. Robert, would you like to greet us from New Zealand? Uh, sure. Tena kaito kato. Uh welcome everyone. Uh welcome to the Kadano Eastern Hemisphere. And uh we're excited and interested uh, to hear what you have to say. I'm wondering who we all meet. Uh, and uh, we want to know what we uh what interests you uh, when we come along and we'll find out what's going on. Uh, we hope this event will make you want to bring others along to the next one. Uh, it's important, as you would have noticed, that everyone speaks in their own uh, language and we've got an opportunity to create those sort of environments for you. Uh, today we, we'll have Indonesian, Japanese, Vietnamese and English rooms uh, and possibly even uh, Filipina. Uh, or uh, Korean, depending on numbers of people coming through. So it's that's always really quite important for us. But like everything that we do here, it's a work in progress. We'll never be finished, we'll never be perfect. And that's so things break, uh, don't always work out. We have a because we're having a bit of fun trying to do this. And every time that we do do things, we iterate a little bit. We try new things out to see what basically is helpful to everyone. Whatever we think is helpful, whatever you think is helpful is what we try to bring together. Uh, so each of the hosts has uh, their own ideas about what, what might work in their rooms, but you can help make these sessions. It's we're actually all about whoever turns up, who turns up are the right people to turn up. You are supposed to be here. Please contribute and um, ask questions, 
provide your own insights, your own perspectives, they're all really important. Uh, but what I do ask is that you respect the host and you support the people and ideas uh, that are in, in the room and just basically be kind to others. Uh, thank you for being here and uh, thanks for being part of the Cardano community. We as the team would actually like to extend the most deepest appreciation that you have voted us in in Fund 8. We are so grateful and we appreciate your continuing support and we are here and hope that we can support you equally. Thank you so much um, for voting for us. Next slide, next slide, please. So this is the catalyst clock and we are at the end of Fund 8. Um, so for the next two weeks from May 18th to the 31st of 2022. Uh, we are going to be having a cool down. There'll be no meetings. You can take a break. You can rethink your ideas, reprocess your ideas, take a minute to digest what has happened. <laughs> um, and then we will launch Fund 9 on June 1st, 2022. Um, we'll go straight into the insight sharing period from June 2nd to June 9th. And the Fund 9 proposal submission will start on the 9th uh, till the 16th, and we'll continue as we go on. Um, I'm sure you're getting familiar with the process now. Uh, I think that's all. Would anyone like to add anything to this? Any comments? Who's glad that we have a cool down? I'm glad. <laughs> yes. Absolutely, yeah. So much work. Thank you, believed. It was a good idea. That was a very good idea. Whoever came up with that, thank you. <laughs> For me, I think it was the coolest announcement after Cardano Mainnet announcement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, just the chill period is very important, I think, to regroup and reflect and to think and just take a little bit of time off. It's really quite good on that front. Uh, so, uh, Angela, do you want to introduce our special guest for tonight uh, or today? Um, uh, yeah. I'd love that. Is Yoram with us? Uh, he is. Are uh, you around? Yes, hello. Hello there, Yoram. How are you? I'm, gonna make I'm you... very well. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for being our special guest. You're here to talk to us about um, the blockchain accelerator. Go right ahead. Yeah, perfect. So my name is Yoram. I, I also live, uh, uh, we speak about the Eastern town halls. So I live in the east of France. Um, so just to connect for that. And I'm sorry that I'm not speaking uh, Indonesian, Vietnamese, uh, Japanese, uh, but it's a pleasure to be here with you all, uh, Chinese and other languages. Um, yeah, so this is a wonderful opportunity. Uh, in Fund7, uh, a company uh, called Seedstars, uh, which is an accelerator and uh, mentor programs in 70 developing countries. Um, you can visit seedstars.com. Uh, they got funded in three proposals of mentorship and acceleration. And one of them is in collaboration uh, to do a startup competition in collaboration with Financial Times and Cardano. Okay, so if you can go to the next slide, please. No, there's only one slide of your slides there. Of that. It's only one slide, oh. sorry, unfortunately. Only one slide, okay, so that's good. So that's good. So basically, um, there is a, the, the competition, there's a competition that is happening now until and people, companies can apply until the end of May. And we are looking for three types of companies to apply. Companies that are already working on the Cardano blockchain and, and uh, wants to apply to the competitions. Companies that are um, working on other chains but considering to come to Cardano blockchains. And companies, um, startups basically, that are not yet working on blockchain but are considering to come and work on the blockchain. Okay, so these three types of, uh, on the Cardano blockchain, obviously. So these three types of companies are most welcome to come and apply. Um, they're going to be, uh, until the end of uh, May, there's going to be three days 
uh, of session from 20 of June to the uh, 22nd of June, which will include mentorship sessions uh, with different experts. And in the end, there's going to be a, a competition and the, vote, the, the winners are going to win uh, and be part of an acceleration program and have access also to potential investors. I mean, all the, all the people that will be selected for the program are going to get exposure to investors and different mentorship programs. There's going to be also some winners that are going to get uh, special treatment. Um, so yeah, we welcome you to uh, click on the link and, and, um, and register and be part of that. It's a very exciting uh, process and great opportunity. Um, around 100 companies already registered, but we want many more to come and register, especially from developing countries. And um, we would love to have a very strong representation from, uh, from Asia uh, joining this competition. So if you have uh, relevant startups, come and join. If you can share it with other uh, friends, uh, also share it with them. Um, the event is going to be um, to get quite a big exposure. Um, uh, also in the media, we expect uh, it's going to be done in the in the studios of the Financial Times. Um, and the, 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 the event on the 22nd, we'll have high level people from Cardano speaking there, other high level guest speakers. So really, really a cool event for, for the community. Um, yeah, I mean, that's in short for that. And, in addition to the startups, we will look just announcing it here. There will be also an opportunity of people if they want to come and, and mentor startups uh, that are on Cardano uh, from the Cardano ecosystem. And obviously, stay tuned to come and see the event and see all the amazing um, projects that are being built on Cardano or that are planning to come to Cardano. I think it will be really a great event for us. Perfect. So that's from my side. Yeah, please. It's very exciting. Yeah, it's, it's amazing and it's coming out of Catalyst. So all of us here, a lot of us are on Catalyst, so they got funded in Catalyst. Um, it's the beginning of uh, collaboration with the community. They are, the Seed Star as a company, they understand the importance of the community and looking how they can work more closely with the community. So um, I think it's an exciting opportunity of having uh, external companies come in and collaborate with the community to create value for the ecosystem. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah. We're definitely looking forward to it. Uh, Jan, I see you have a question. Yes, I do. Thank you, Angela. Uh, Yoram, I was wondering if people that are interested from other blockchains, when they, if they were to be accepted this in, into this incubator, will there be a, a session with Cardano developers to see how they can uh, 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 can be applied to, to, to onto Cardano? Yeah, so it's a very good question, and I'm going to leave here in the chat. It does, they used, they, there was a few days ago, there was Ask Me Anything uh, with a few Cardano experts um, talking about uh, how companies can come to Cardano. But if needed, and there's a lot of requests, we will make it again. So definitely. Uh, but I will share the link already of the video. And uh, if other companies are interested, we can initiate another, another call like that. Um, so definitely. Uh, yeah. I look forward to uh, if yes, you could, the reason why we couldn't show your presentation was because we uh, don't have permission. Only I do, Lynn and the others. But perhaps if you could change the permissions on it so everyone could see it at um, some point. I'll put a link into the actual presentation uh, in the chat there for people. And so uh, just if you could change the permission level. On but that I can there. see your inside. So I think the permission is open. I can see uh, you in the presentation. I, I can get in, but no one else can. And that's mm, why okay. we were having problems uh, because Lynn's doing the screen sharing. Perfect. I will, uh, I will have to change it. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. And I will share the, the link for the uh, Emma in a sec, in a bit. And that, that way, everyone, you can see the link to what Joran was talking about there. I'll put some other information into the chat, uh, which is basically um, pointers to C stars and also to um, the material about uh, the date of application, along with the link that you'll also find in his presentation. Okay. Yeah, and please and please do, even if you're not sure or so on, please apply and um, yeah, we'll give you 
hopefully will come through and be part of the 50. We are, we are looking into having 50 uh, startups basically going through this uh, process, through the event itself. So yeah, please apply. That is pretty awesome, Yaron. That's good to see. Good stuff. Is there any other questions from anyone at all? Anyone that, uh, yeah? We've got Jan, you got a question? Sorry, I keep asking questions. Okay. Uh, but uh, Yoram, uh, regarding uh, uh, the, the funds, uh, because uh, I, I read that after going through this incubator, we will then have access to the funds of Seed Stars. Uh, uh, yes, what yeah. is the nature of these funds? Is, is these funds um, somewhat like catalyst funds where they only seek a return of intent or are is these does these funds has investment um, traditional investment uh, request yeah so very good questions and ask um, you can ask many more because they are very, very good the questions so um, so they are getting into exposure, all the companies in the process get into exposure to the seed stars networks of investor. And that's the default and it's a quite a big nest network of investor interested in companies in developing countries, right? The default because this is the network. So this is one. And the winners, I mean, from the winners, they are going into a, yeah evaluation process also of the funds, direct funds of seed stars. Okay, and we hope that in the future, the potentially will be also funds that are joined to Cardano and Seed Stars uh, based on certain scenarios. So all the information again will be available and will be sent to all the investors that these companies were selected and went through the process. And some of the, and the winners are going to go into a more deep evaluation of the, of the investment process. Um, and, and normally, and it doesn't guarantee investment 100% in, in this specific case, but it does guarantee, you know, going through the acceleration and um, and getting all the exposure and information they have and knowledge they have. Okay, and the network, and they have very, very big network actually of mentors as well. Uh, I don't remember the number, but I think around 1,000 mentors around the world. Um, so also quite interesting to get in this network of uh, mentors. Yeah, it's, it's a great opportunity, I think, for people uh, thinking of setting up a new startup or trying to figure it out or haven't done it before, those sort of things. These types of programs are a fantastic way to, to learn, uh, to prepare yourself and also be um, connected into networks of people that are interested. So any other questions? Jan, you are welcome to ask questions more if you wish. Hmm. <laughs> no. I have no one else. <laughs> yeah. No one else. Right. Well, uh, thank you very much, Yoram. Um, and uh, you'll be hanging around here for a little bit, I take it, uh, in one of yeah, the breakout sure. rooms and things like that. So if there's any sort of questions, we're going to have that. So with that, uh, I'm about to open up, I'll open up the uh, breakout rooms and please um, join in to where you, you want to go. Uh, the, and you're also welcome to jump into any of the rooms at any time. So um, you can just assign yourselves to the breakout rooms. They're available at the bottom there. and um we'll... yeah and i just say I'm, I'm still looking for the i will i will share it and my computer also crashed one of the ones that crashed when i tried to log in so i'm still i will get for you the link for the ask me anything which is very helpful so i'll get it in okay. a few minutes cool thanks okay and we can put that into the chat uh on anything yeah. excellent so if you'd like to assign yourselves to the various different rooms and the host will come in and join you and uh we'll kick off our usual sort of breakout rooms Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Robert. So, uh, untuk teman-teman dari Indonesia, silakan join di breakout room di bawah ini di Indonesia. Nanti kita akan workshopnya di situ. Terima kasih. Xin mời tất cả các bạn chờ tham dự phòng họp Việt Nam thì có thể join vào phòng họp Việt Nam ở cái link bên dưới cái breakout room của Việt Nam. Xin cảm ơn. Nếu ai mình không không trôi được thì um, mình báo với uh, em để mà em đưa mình vào phòng của mình.
Hi, Ken. How's it going? Hi. Yeah, things are going okay. Oh, that's good to know. That's good to know. Haven't seen you for a little while. I was actually thinking of you the other day. Uh, it's good to see you around. Yeah. Ah. Uh, so where are you located at the moment? Me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where are you I'm located? Still in, still in Malawi. Yeah, it's still a long way. Oh, okay. A long way in Malawi. Ah, right. I thought you were only there for a, a few months uh, when we last saw you. Yeah, uh, I I got extended my stay. Okay. Actually, I I got married a few months ago, so I married a Malawian woman. So. Ah, oh, congratulations! Yeah, it's good to hear. That's really yeah, good thanks. Hear. All right. And we've got Felix in here, and we've got Anne in here. And who else is we? We're going to have a small room, English room, this tonight. Oh, well, then that's always good. Um, right. What I thought uh, we would do today um, is I was actually going to go through all the uh, challenges. And uh, Lynn, uh, Anne and I had done this before in uh, Fund 8. And if anyone's interested, we can go through all the challenges that have been voted and just sort of talk about them more broadly if you want to, unless there's anything else people would like to talk about, um, we are happy to adapt. And one of the things in particular I'm interested in is uh, looking at how um, the sort of different challenges that were put up for East Africa in Fund um, 8, now, as I understand it, none of them got voted. Is that correct, Angela? Uh, Angela? That's correct. Okay. Um, and so, so I'd like to sort of use that as a sort of context to think about stuff. And Yoram, since you're here as well, you've had a few uh, proposals funded for your regenerative uh, ag work around the milk nuts, is that correct? Um, yeah, in Ghana, I'm so excited about this one, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm a small part of the team, but uh, it's a very exciting one. So one of the things here, Yoram, is, that is interesting is um, Angela and Jackie have been looking into the idea of um, coffee production in Uganda, Tanzania, uh, Democratic Republic and Kenya. Uh, and particularly the small lot holdings of coffee. And they're interested in seeing how they can uh, retain both the tradition and also obviously lift the economic well-being of those uh, eco um, growers. And uh, so the milk nut stuff, uh, what was it, what's it called again, the, uh, the work uh, that you're doing? In his 21st century, I'm going to share the link. I'm looking for the link. 21st century agri supply chain. Yeah. Um, and, so, yeah. so there'll be a sort of a lot, lot of overlap and stuff with what's going on. But what I actually wanted to do was just go through, first and foremost, um, just the proposals. There aren't too many this time around. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen and just uh, do that if I can figure out how to share my screen um, in a way that. Uh, Let's see here, let's get it sizable. And I think it's that one there. Right. Can you see that all right? Um, yeah. You got the presentation up, everyone? No, we see kind of your Discord, I think. Oh, okay. Oh, got the wrong Discord. Hold on. See, I'm not very good on my screen sharing at the moment. Here we are, got the wrong one. That's better. Um, so please just open up talk or um, ask any questions or anything else that have come, come in. Uh, Felix has put in something about the uh, an analysis of the, I'll pull that out, of the proposals, that's cool. Right. Um, so obviously the, the challenges themselves haven't actually uh, you know, been put up onto uh, idea scale for Fund 9, but we know what they are. So we've gone through and just had a 
brief sort of look at them and work through. And what I'm going to do here is just group up. Uh, I've grouped the sort of challenges into a sort of rough similarity or relationship in terms of what's actually going on. And I find um, looking at the challenges coming through really and understanding all of them uh, helps actually formulate a lot of the proposals that are coming, uh, formulates your writing of the proposals. Uh, what I noticed early on within uh, a lot of the fun write, proposal writing work uh, was that people had an idea and they just kind of put the proposal wrote the proposal in it and with a high degree of disregard for the actual challenge that it was going in to. Uh, that has changed and it's improving over time. But let's have a look at what's um, actually going on in those challenges uh, in this time around. Um, so one of the first ones up out of the rank is uh, one that was put up by Utah, and it's uh, coming, so it's coming out of the Japanese community. And this is pretty much looking at how do you get students involved into Catalyst. Uh, in a sense, particularly, it's, this is particularly focused on the idea of uh, entrepreneurial side of things, so business schools, uh, marketing people, but also you know, obviously computer science and technical side of things could also come in here. The key thing is that it's to encourage uh, students to do two things. One, get them into the Cardano ecosystem and thinking about opportunities in that space but also to give them experience in terms of pitching and proposing and so that they can see what their sort of career opportunities could be. And as such, as a result of that, each of the proposals is limited to 5,000 US dollars equivalent. Okay, uh, so uh, he's got some pretty clear ideas. It's actually from Utah and one of her uh, student who is a member of the um, Eastern Town Hall. Uh, they both contribute in here and have discussions and stuff. So that's the key one here. How can we get young people, fresh minds that haven't been exposed to the old ways, that haven't been totally disillusioned, uh, is something that could really work with universities. In fact, I've sent this very challenge off to Auckland University staff, faculty members, and said, hey, do you want to um, uh, um, you know, see about seeing if you can get your students and involved in this, especially since the university itself is trying to figure out how to um, open and manage a Cardano wallet at the moment as we speak, um, which is uh, giving them a bit of, sending them into a bit of a tailspin, apparently, I've been told. Uh, so so, um, so uh, the next one is uh, the DREP improvements and onboarding. This is also one coming out of um, Utah, out of the wonderful mind of Utah and his challenge and stuff like that. And that is to how can we sort of uh, achieve diversity within the so-called DREP proposal? And perhaps, um, Felix, I know you just wanted to sit back and relax, but I never take an opportunity. Perhaps you could explain a little bit about what's what the D, DREP's sort of work is or the ideas behind it. Yeah, let's go for it, because it's a fascinating topic. And DREPs mostly are part of what is called the uh, liquid democracy, which combines direct and representative democracy, which means, for example, in a nation like in Swiss, everybody has a direct, uh, there's a direct democracy. It means everybody can vote on any, everything, like we have in Catalyst right now, for example. Everybody can vote on any, any challenges and any proposals. The problem is that many people don't want to vote and or are not well informed to vote, are too lazy to vote or don't have time to vote or whatnot. And the solution there then is to say, okay, here you bring a representative democracy part in it and you have people in the community to which you are able to delegate your voting power to. You are not obligated. This is really just an additional. You can vote on anything what you want, but you can also delegate your voting power to a specific person. Let's say, for example, you're not the deaf guy, but you want to cast your vote on, on for example, products and integrations challenge, but, and you know somebody who is really a very well-educated tech guy, and you trust that this person might be able to make a good decision for you. So you would delegate your vote to this DREP, delegation representative. This is basically the, the role of a delegation representative. The role is really thought to be a full-time paid job in Project Catalyst as well. Means will be included into our own budget as well. Like for example, right now the CAs, the VCAs and preferers voters are paid so that you have your own budget allocation. 
to allow DRAPs because it will require a lot of work, I think, when you really want to make it properly. And yeah, so that's the idea on it so far. It's the, in fund nine. Right now, there is a sign up already for first onboarding of people who are interested to become a DRAP, but it's not on place yet. And the first pilot might be, take place maybe in fund 10, something like this, fund nine, fund 10, maybe later. But yeah, like each role in Catalyst, like the CAs, the VCAs on the beginning, you don't really have exactly the picture what they are doing, or like with the challenge teams, you set up the role already and then you evolve the role over the iterations in Catalyst. Yeah, and so uh, this the core of this um, challenge is to try and think about how to ensure from day one that uh, one people know about the DREPs, or what it is, what they might need to do, even if the role is not that well defined, um, which is a good thing, I might point out, because you don't want to define things up. And instead, we're trying to actually let the community sort of uh, figure it out. And so a key point here is trying to figure it out within this challenge and making sure that that figuring out is done as in a diverse way as po possible. Um, certainly, if you, um, for voting and things like that, there's a well-known problem within any sort of uh, delegative, de representative sort of democracy or even direct democracy is uh, voter fatigue and the sheer amount of effort required just in voting in itself. So there's different tools to actually enable us to do that. Um, voting here, by voting, I'm actually meaning um, making decisions. It does not necessarily have to be a vote uh, in a voting mechanism. And in fact, that's usually the last thing you want to do in any sort of democracy. There's always a sort of con cons consensus sort of building approach first. Uh, so um, here it's really how do we make decisions in a um, uh, wider way using different types of tools. So from direct to delegated and then the combination of two, which is going on here. Okay, so, um, so the main thing thrust of this particular challenge is developing uh, the content or understanding or starting to explore how that DREPS function works. Okay. Uh, that seems to be uh, the purpose of that challenge. Right. Uh, another one is legal and financial implementations. Uh, this is really around helping proposers, funded proposers, sort out actual um, I don't know, let's have an, funded proposers find, will find solutions, legal and financial solutions for funded proposers. Um, so that means actually trying to bring on onboard lawyers and accountants. Speaking from experience, accountants are really hard to get on, especially auditors, which I've been trying for years. Uh, but uh, lawyers weren't much better, but I've got a whole army of lawyers uh, chiming in now, uh, which is a good thing. But uh, these, this is more the day-to-day -day type of uh, services and, and uh, things that could come on board. For example, getting some sort of standard types of contracts would be useful. Uh, understanding the regulation in a given locale would be useful in this area. Uh, if there's particularly if there's no guidance and those sort of things around how to do tax treatment uh, or uh, what uh, liabilities, KYC requirements um, are needed and those sort of things coming in and trying to turn those into tools that um, funded proposers can have right, and can have use and use. It could be something like um, there is actually a LexDAO and oh, there's one more, I can't remember the name of it, which is literally a whole bunch of lawyers coming together to try and provide services with DAOs. So that's a good example of the sort of thing that comes in. Um, so those those are the first crop of uh, things. Are there any sort of questions or thoughts or discussions around those three that um, might interest anyone? Anyone? But you know, you can ask and stop me at any time as I'm uh, rabbiting on here. It doesn't have to be a monologue, <laughs> please. <laughs> uh, right. About the about yeah. the legal and financial implementations, there's also a beautiful story behind because this challenge we wrote with um, Andre and Mero stuff which are the Catalyst Circle Treasurers and with which we found the Treasurer Guild as well. And 
they run a challenge team as well. And your main goal is really also to say to establish a fixed team, like a little bit, I think, was already, I think the first initiative came up with the Eastern Town Hall, that you have a team for a challenge, which runs the challenge over a longer time frame. They are sure they resubmit their challenge in each funding round. They make sure they are improved. They check the VC and the CA feedback on the challenge. They look how it performs. And they run as a challenge team over several funding rounds. So to, make, to really identify, oh, OK, what is the project doing? And if the project is strong enough, like Eastern Town Hall, then the project makes sense to become a whole challenge. Because you know what you provide or what you try to do is just a single part and you need a bunch of others who are, who are helping out, right? That's mm -hmm. something what I think it's an extremely beautiful process which established in Catalyst, that you have teams which touch or which have such a diversity that it makes sense to give them a whole own challenge and to take charge of this challenge as well. Do it then, shepherd them moving forward. So, if, Cool. Okay. Um, right. On to uh, the next lot, um, which this is kind of starting to, uh, you can kind of see we're uh, like getting students in and then uh, doing some of the governance related things uh, and then looking at law and finance and the accounting aspects of things can actually then start to lead into what do the new networked organizations look like and how do they operate? And this is obviously the type of DAO and all these sort of fra uh, fabric um, that is needed uh, to, to happen. And the reason why um, I mentioned earlier that Auckland University is getting in on the fold is because one of the proposals that was funded in Fund 8 um, include, is to do with a lot of legal work. And it's explicitly to try and figure out how we can do the sort of funding um, what the type of funding for impact investment. But to one of the people on that has done her PhD in the regulations associated with DAOs, right? And that's why she's sort of trying to get in, uh, more involved in this side of things. Um, so, you know, we can get all the, there's a lot of uh, things within technology itself. And this, this particular challenge here is going to be tended to, to focus more on the technology side of things, but we can't forget that there's also a huge amount of human aspects to DAOs. They may have you know, a, a wallet and things like that, but there's also a lot of human aspects to it that we can't just you know, wave our hands and wash away in terms of technology. Um, and the other thing is obviously working in with uh, established norms say within the legal systems and accounting systems and stuff. So we've got to try and put, those are all the sort of tools. We've got to try and put um, things together that help people start to organize. And this is what largely this DAO, DAOs love Kadana. And there's certainly the core thrust of this particular challenge is that there's quite a lot of tools already being built on uh, um, Ethereum based blockchains. Um, and the argument here, which I tend to agree with, we first of all had currencies as in tokens and things like that. Then we started getting DeFi, decentralized finance, that's going to take over Wall Street, but becomes Wall Street. Uh, we then have uh, NFTs that are uh, nascent sort of early stage notions of property title, even though they're just the popular term is basically a token with some metadata pointing to a JPEG. Uh, but um, the... The, the next sort of stage, those three things prior start to come into their own uh, within networked types of organizational forms. And indeed, at the Eastern Town Hall at stuff in terms of the way we're trying to sort of organize ourselves yeah, is as a kind of a proto DAO or you know, whatever that might mean. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to figure out a whole lot of ways of how do we work together when we're sitting across six, seven different countries, different uh, approximate time zones and all coming from different languages, uh, different backgrounds and different levels of experience. And so, yeah, looking into things here is what's, uh, what the DAO Slav Kadano is about. I think there is a tendency towards building tools in this domain, um, which was typical of, you know, obviously a technical project. Uh, but do, do not forget the human side of things. Humans, humans are what make styles. Humans are fragile creatures. Uh, we make lots of errors and things like that. And try and understand actually what uh, the problem is first before you go off and build technology. So that's what I'd sort of like to see happen um, in these this sort of challenge. But nonetheless, um, 
this is a good starting point, Angela, with respect to like uh, Regen Ag, um, the coffee stuff, the things that sort of Yoram is trying to do with the sort of um, supply chains of uh, um, trans bring in transparency and things like that. Fundamentally, the idea of a DAO, DAO is how do we organize ourselves in a dynamic, interconnected way? So what tools and things like that can help us do that? And there's quite a bit of tools and, and let's say bridges back into the legal components as well. Okay, so what goes in here? Um, you know, you've heard me talk about one of my favorite, which is coordinate. Uh, there's, you've seen things possibly like source cred has another sort of tool for DAOs. Um, there's uh, one of the most popular sort of things within Ethereum that kind of makes a DAO is things like um, Gnosis Safe, which is actually a multi-signature um, tool. Now, one of the arguments here within this framework is that the underlying architecture of Cardano is probably better suited for some of the DAO-based types of tools. And so, for example, we don't need uh, uh, smart contracts to do the NFTs or to do tokens or to do multi-signature support. Uh, therefore, uh, it's more reliable in the long run, so we should be able to do more things, more transparency, okay? Right, um, now these the next two, oops, uh, the next two are actually the same, but we'll just talk on um, uh, this. And this actually, the combination of the two actually represents a significant chunk of um, the Fund 9 proposals. And this is products and integrations, or um, what the next one is called D apps and integrations. They're actually fundamentally the same because product and integration was coming out of the PACE group. Um, it was a, a, an attempt to actually try and standardize the challenges across um, all subsequent rounds. And so now what we've actually got are two challenges that are ostensibly the same. And in fact, you'll look at the two and they've got similar sort of language because this particular challenge actually uh, learned from or was trying to define this challenge. Um, so what is it? Um, this is very much a product focus and again, you know, we've talked about things such as the, the coffee pro, uh, challenge or um, any of the regen ag and things or way is doing all sort of the um, uh, fast um, textiles based fashion collectives, those sort of things. Um, they are fundamentally underneath the hoods, a series of products um, in terms of software products, but also um, real world physical products as well. So uh, here, again, the emphasis is more on the tooling, um, more of the uh, um, technology in many respects, but tooling here could also include um, necessary um, education or even sort of blueprints trying to do architects thinking about the problem. Um, so uh, we have spoken before like Yoram and um, you've got within your particular problem, you've got to focus on the Far, um, farm advisors, is that correct? Yoram? Yeah, so no, we, the, within agriculture supply chains, I mean, a big challenge is how you start from boots on the ground, right? So how you start from the farmer, from the farmers and analyzing the farmers and starting creating, for example, digital identities for the farmers and, and grouping them into potentially a, co a cooperative type DAO. And so all of that, work is being is going to be done on the on on this phase where we are going to come up with that with ideas for applications so, i mean it's actually perfect uh, that can be built mm. right so uh, cost supply chain and, and this specific use case is being done where you have also um, a cooperate in singapore that is actually off tech in the products which is very good so you have um connection between the work on the ground to, to the bio. Yeah. Uh, and so, so this is where you can take a sort of wide lens to what sort of applications or tools can be used that have a very much strong market focus. That's what's meant by product. Um, and in the case of what's meant by integration is hooking into existing services. And those don't necessarily have to be blockchain based ones either. You could be bringing in uh, something, connecting something in to um, the blockchain or to Cardano in this case here. So any of the payments tools like Koti and things like that as an example, point of sale systems, um, doing accounting. Um, so hooking in like the previous um, 
one of the previous challenges there is actually doing the uh, bookkeeping and accounting, I should say, interface over what we're doing. Um, so Cardano itself is the back end of a bookkeeping system, but you've got to put accounting over the top and those sort of things can fit into that. As I said, um, this one, uh, the dApps and integration is a challenge that has been repeated uh, many times. It's been one it's from fund two, I think fund one. In fact, it was one of really the first ones to uh, challenges and it's been going through. Uh, as you can see from um, these two, they're, they're identical. Um, if you actually go and read them, they are identical. Uh, so you've effectively got, uh, what is it, nearly 8 million US dollars allocated to products and integration in Fund 9, okay? Uh, and while there will be a strong emphasis on the technology and MVPs, uh, min minimum viable products, those sort of things, uh, then that's uh, what's going to go in here. So, for example, Angela, the coffee stuff, would be a particularly good um, thing if you're looking at the idea of a cooperative to help uh, Kenyan, Tanzanian and um, you know, Ugandan sort of coffee growers to do something, then essentially it could become a, a coffee grower advisory network as the product. And in which case you could have multiple proposals that actually go across um, all of these that we've talked about so far. Uh, so the product being a advisory network to help things. Uh, if you recall within the digital identity, a teleprism work, uh, there was a reference to the uh, uh, Yo, oh, can't remember, it's Yo, Yoma network, uh, which is basically jobs for um, young African students, young adults. Uh, to actually build up their credibility and things like that. And so the focus on that was on the trust framework side of things. Um, this is the sort of thing that we could start to link to as a series of products, uh, a series of proposals that go towards that higher objective of what you're trying to achieve, which is to uh, emancipate, if you like, and ensure that the future, there's future prosperity for traditional sort of growers and small lot growers of farming. Um, yeah, and Robert, yeah. one thing on that. You, you might, they didn't get funded, right, finally? I don't think they got funded, but I'm not sure. Uh, not sure. Yeah. Not sure on that. Okay, kind. because a, a sister company of Yuma, actually a company that provided some of the technology, uh, did get funded, and it's a good world. Oh, and okay. they also work a lot, they work a lot on, you know, they didn't get funded for DID, but uh, they got funded for a couple of other proposals, I think only for also for Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a very strong network of next gen, uh, and they're actually thinking on to, to go on the DID as well. So um, if there is yeah. interest there, I'm happy to make the connection. As you can see here, how something like um, this can sort of go through, you can have a proposal that's focused on, you know, getting students on board, encouraging to think about that helps towards your vision or whatever, you, whatever it is you're trying to achieve. Um, you can then, uh, Get them thinking those same students or others thinking about uh, representation on a decentralized network you can then figure also look at um, how can you do the legal implications of what you need to achieve um, how can you bring in people that might be helping these farmers out as accountants as lawyers those sort of things um, and then you know you can frame it up as a DAO. Uh, this is what we're trying to do how do we do collectives that are self owned or governed you've got lots of experience like the uh, idris i think is uh, from Ethiopia, isn't it? Very similar sort of notions. You could probably borrow a lot and think about those. Um, and then obviously we've got the product and integrations with it. It's quite a large amount of funding. You can look at what we're doing, but that's how you can sort of start to build up different sort of proposals across all of these. Okay. Um, so as I said, uh, those two are fundamentally the same. Um, on that side of things. So is there any other observations or questions about those with those three before I jump on to the next lot? Any thoughts? No? Okay. Um, so uh, the next lot is a continuation more focused on uh, developer ecosystem within uh, the Cardano ecosystem and beyond. In this case here, cross-chain collaboration. Now, um, for a long time, up until probably about 2020, 
20, yeah, 2020, maybe 2021, it was very much, you're a maxi. You know, the attitude was that you're a Bitcoin maxi and there's only going to be one ring to rule them all. And then you're a Ethereum maxi and there's only going to be one ring to rule them all. And quietly, I always recall and always liked that Charles was always going, no, we've got to interoperate. We've got to work across other chains and things like that. There isn't going to be one ring. Um, there never will be. There will be a lot of different centers of um, decision making, and you know, which is basically this idea of polycentric networks. And they're dynamic and those interrelationships, just as we are talking about with DAOs, we've got to bridge across into other networks. It's incredibly important to do that. And ultimately, that's actually what contain, gives us robustness across the board, that we can work with different things. So this is what the cross-chain collaboration work is. And Felix might want to talk about that more since he was the person that was sort of pushing that and uh, uh, getting this off the ground in the funds eight, wasn't it, Felix, that you managed to get that done? Fund seven and then eight. Um, exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. So do you want to talk a little bit about um, aims and ambitions of the cross-chain collaboration and what's been done so far? Definitely. Um, one client great point is already to really see, I think, the sign already from the Cardano community that they really want to move cross-chain, which also shows you, hey, those are not maximalist guys like Robert said, for example. So it's a really nice proof already that our community definitely sees the value in it and really wants to try for it as well. And what happened since the first challenge got submitted, we really, for example, Wolfram joined the, the Catalyst mm -hmm. community, very actively participating in town halls as well, really as a scientist is coming with whole Catalyst governance analytics now and everything. The challenge team itself reached out to a bunch of other blockchains and really introducing them into Project Catalyst. So with Kilt, for example, there was just uh, Philip, for example, one of the guys as well who wrote the challenge with us, and Tommy Astikain, there became, cause of this challenge, something like Catalyst ambassadors reaching out to other, where we reach out to other blockchain, DLT communities, ecosystems, inviting them, introducing them. So that's a really beautiful sign. And very often, and almost in all the cases, other, other blockchain communities and ecosystems are really interested in what is going on in Catalyst, where I see the biggest impact that one day Catalyst might grow out Cardano. Hmm. Because what we develop here in Catalyst are processes which might be very effective for other blockchains as well. When you look on DeepFund, which is, a, for example, exactly the same like Project Catalyst on SingularityNet, which I'm migrating to Cardano right now, they built the exact same process up. They have proposals, build on liquid democracy, voting on it, then uh, distributing the funds, and they communicate very close already with Project Catalyst. They set it up together, as they are in partnership already since a while. So what we see also is that what we develop here in Catalyst, it's not the stuff what we actually build, it's the processes which we develop, which might have a huge impact in other cross chain and other blockchain communities and ecosystems as well. And I think this is really something very remarkable about this community. Yeah, and, and, and a very simple example where um, yeah, non chains will be optimized for different sort of purposes uh, and different deployment options and different trust environments and those sort of things. And we, we see that if you look at a lot of all the different projects, particularly the initial sort of starting phase was this idea of permissioned versus permissionless or open and, and um, uh, what do they call it? The hyperledger type situation where um, it was, uh, you had to be invited in to use it. So it was a private sort of chain of a collective or you've got things like Indy, which is a kind of public and permissioned. Anyone can read from it, but only a certain group can actually write to it. And each of these sort of blockchains are optimized for trying to do different things. Solana is optimized to try and uh, really pump through the numbers for DeFi related types of activity to do it really, really fast uh, without necessarily worrying about uh, whether they're robust or anything else like that, because, you know, the, the performance is the most important thing. Um, and as a result, miners are really, really big. You've got to have a lot of capital to actually deploy them. 
if you're trying to go for uh, economic identity, which is what Kadana, then uh, the ideas of peer review science really, really matter because you're trying to build really, really strong infrastructure. Uh, that come every time we do any sort of engineering, software engineering, we come into trade-offs and we can't do everything. Zcash has pioneered zero knowledge proofs. Manoa and a few others are doing similar sort of things. Um, we may have them in our, uh, in, in the Cardano environment eventually, um, but it's these sort of things where they're, they're targeting different types of environments. Um, so uh, likewise, uh, probably where we'll see a lot of sort of cross-chain support is in things like um, blockchain storage options. So even within the Eastern Town Hall, some of the stuff that I'm working on at the moment uh, to do uh, um, some of our um, paying and rewarding contributors from our community for doing like translations and things is going to use our weave as a storage. Now it would be great to see us connecting into that, making that process a lot easier. And also so that, you know, I could pay for my our weave storage using um, Ada because there's some way to actually bridge across the two and convert almost instantly at some sort of fixed price if someone's done that sort of thing. And it just makes things a lot, lot easier for us and more robust, honestly, uh, because um, you know, if we are all using the same technology and it turns out to be a bug, then the whole system can fall apart. If we're all using slightly different versions and things that are optimized for different purposes, we, uh, we are a lot more resilient overall. So this is kind of really kind of important stuff. Um, and as Felix sort of says, it's extending the processes of um, most of these blockchains have all got community-based funds. Um, so let's try and bring them into the network. That helps Cardano overall. It creates a halo effect, you know, because people will start using things. They'll say, oh, this Catalyst thing is not bad. They're way ahead on us now. Um, so yeah, it's all good. Right. Um, the great migration. Uh, this is different from interoperability. Interoperability is about reaching out and holding hands. You know, we can all go off and say kumbaya together and say, hey, isn't life lovely? Uh, this one is more, more aggressive in stance. It's saying, get off Ethereum, come and go on to the Cardano network. Uh, now, there's stages we can do that. We can start off by saying, oh, bring all your uh, EVM-based contracts and stick them onto our EVM side chain and uh, life is all good. You know, we can, we can live in harmony. Uh, the next sort of stage is, well, actually, you know, the EVM's a little broken. Let's go on to the Yelly network and, you know, we can fix some of your problems so you can get higher, higher degree of assur assurance. But if you're feeling really, really, really brave, you know, you might go and say, whoa, this extended UTXO business is much, much better than the EVM because ultimately that's the kind of thing that we're in in terms of uh, the key question here is the distinction between an EVM account-based architecture or the extended UTXO uh, blockchain uh, architecture that Cardano has and a few others. And ultimately that's the key difference. Yes, um, uh, most mind share is on the EVM side of things, uh, even though the uh, original blockchain Bitcoin uses a UTXO model. Cognitively, it's a lot harder for us little programmers uh, to get our heads around things like the UTXO model. So EVM is good. So how do we bring people across other projects? How can we help other projects that might be on Ethereum and basically can't do anything because they've got uh, non-deterministic uh, high gas fees and they don't know what's going on and we can go in and say hey we might be able to help you here let's bring you across okay um, so that's sort of really what this is about looking into how can we migrate uh, people off uh, projects off Ethereum and or more specifically off the EVM and into Cardano and make uh, life better for them. Um, I think you'll find also that generally uh, doing this as um, you know, also part of the cross-chain thing, uh, because to help with cross-chain support, projects have got to know that they can actually support another chain. And that's where a lot of, of, of the newer blockchain-based projects are trying to be EVM compatible because it enables them to attract developers more easily. Right, um, and building on Blockfrost. Um, I don't know if people know what Blockfrost is or not, but it's, it's basically a, um, 
a HTTP API over two services that are essentially mean you don't have to run your own infrastructure for the wallet backend and the, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, it's very similar to uh, the, in the Ethereum world, Infra, which is, uh, does the um, APIs and stuff onto the Ethereum blockchain. So Block, for, block Frost here is intended to um, make life easier for the great swathes of JavaScript and these days maybe TypeScript, but web-based web application developers and make life really easy for them. A number of the projects to date have actually built on top of the Block Frost work. That means um, they can access the APIs and get access to the wallet and uh, all the transactions coming through without having to run that themselves. And the intention within the Block Frost environment is to actually turn that the back end, which is the key component here, into an open source environment. Because uh, quite frankly, if everyone's going for convenience, which you know makes sense, people want to go for convenience, means that they'll end up uh, using Block Frost, and then we basically get a, a single point of failure in the network. We may have this wonderful back end of a decentralized self-governed community governed blockchain, but everyone's going through a proprietary block uh, API set and back in, you've actually just re-centralized everything. So it's actually quite important to try and build out that ecosystem to be open source. And this challenge here is not only to build on Block Frost, but to build out Block Frost to help um, you know, build out the ecosystem of the people that are using it, but also build the tools itself to help to make it help to make that backend open source. Uh, that's the intention of this particular challenge. Um, and I think I think that's actually supposed to be 500,000, I think. Yeah. Um, not 50,000. Um, I might be wrong. Is that, uh, let's have a look. Oops. Uh, I'll look at it later. I think it's 500,000, sorry. Right, um, any sort of questions on those three? Anything, uh, oops. Uh, as you can see here, these are very much focused on um, a technical lens of how things are working. So I was just wondering if there's no questions. Okay, right. Um, the final one really, and um, that is very much developer, this has been around in Fund8, Fund7, is to build out the developer ecosystem. Generally, so this is a more general sort of proposal that is building the tools, SDKs, those sort of things to actually help um, developers, even learning materials, uh, the um, you know, just different sets of tools to help developers build applications. Uh, so uh, it could include working with command line tools, SDKs, documentation, um, any number of things that could fit in that. Uh, that have more of a developer focus. It's not specifically open source, but um, like in Fund8, there was actually two versions of this challenge. There was the developer ecosystem and another one that carved out for open source that said, well, you know, you can go and do the open source side of things. Uh, there's actually really no need for two. Um, I know the intent was to try and emphasize open source, but the developer ecosystem, we can have open source development. And that's always a good thing, but it's not always possible. Um, so, you know, these, this is what this particular challenge is for. Okay. Um, and I would really also see it together with, for example, products and integrations or apps and mm -hmm. products and integrations. Those are challenges on what to do. And the developer ecosystem then is the challenge on how do we want those people to do this? Mm -hmm. So quite a nice synergy to both as well. Yeah. Yeah, so as you can see there, that we sort of got um, leading through in terms of like starting at the top, you know, what's the real intent for all of this is really, you know, the whole idea of money is as an information system that helps humans co coordinate. So um, the store of value is in the community, which happens to be at the moment for most people is in um, the, that are dealing with nation currencies, sovereign currencies, the value is in the current country and their ability to extract ta taxes. Um, so fundamentally, it rests on the idea of what's referred to as legal violence, the ability to lock you up in jail, whereas a lot of the stuff here um, is uh, driven through the store of value is built by the communities themselves that start to build value, start to build relationships, start to build trust. And that's a completely different model. And so these sort of things start to build up on that. Um, what does that team want to build? What does it want to do? 
you know, come together. What is it trying to achieve? And so we can do the products and integration. Uh, and then we can say, well, we might need to hook into other blockchains like how we've, um, you know, like oracles, like, um, and different things like that. Uh, maybe we can take some existing code for open source code from some Ethereum based projects and bung them straight on to uh, um, Cardano and we've got a win straight away you know, to try and solve our problem. And then uh, building on the block frost, if we need to basically make some of the uh, front end tools a lot better, then we can come in and do proposals there. And then finally, at the bottom end of that, as Felix pointed out, from the high level product side of things, the organizational side of things, we can come down and say, well, these are the actual developer tools that we need to build that, the, that are missing in the network that you know, we don't understand or we need, or we need to be built. Um, it could be as simple as converting one set of tools that have been written for JavaScript into TypeScript into Rust into whatever to make it really easy for developers to uh, use the tools and environments they have because then that makes it a lot life a lot easier. Uh, one of the most biggest successes within um, the Ethereum camp was actually Web 3 JS, the JavaScript library for hooking into um, Ethereum. And that had a great deal of success on that side of things. Right. Um, now, finally, we kind of get into the community based ones uh, the Grow Africa, Grow Kadana, that's been around since pretty much uh, uh, what, Fund Three, isn't it? Since Steve, uh, Steve and. Um, um, uh, oh, what's his name? Uh, I've forgotten his name. Um, Greg, sorry, Greg first put together um, to help us actually grow uh, the African continent. Okay, uh, so here we've got um, the ability, anyone that's got some association with Africa to come and put proposals in that particular market to try and do products or or DAOs or legal work as well in that particular environment or even the digital identity sort of related things for our coffee growers could fit into this criteria. It's wide open in that sense. So it's only constrained by locality in terms of some sort of association with that. And with it, we have our own uh, Grow East Asia, Grow Cardano that perhaps, you know, Angela, since you are on the challenge team, might want to talk about uh, and uh, see what you think it is all about. It's similar to the African one though as well, with links into Asia on that side. Did you want to add anything to that, um, Angela? Um, it's just a really interesting challenge, right? Because it's a huge geographical area. Um, there's so many languages spoken. There's so many uh, differences in educational backgrounds, and um, you know, so so the buildup of or or the focus on actually having a challenge for different localities is really, really, really interesting, and it's it's amazing to see what the potential is. Um, it's really exciting to work with this team. And I was actually in the challenge team meeting with Andreas yesterday, uh, just reporting, uh, checking in and proving that we're alive. <laughs> um, and to see that in the previous uh, fund, fund eight, there was mostly um, Africans and East Asians in the Grow Community Challenge that actually proved they were alive. And so it's very interesting to see uh, in the one year since they announced the Grow Africa or, or Cardano announced on a larger scale that they're going into Africa, the effect that one year has had um, in terms of ideas, in terms of community growth, in terms of uh, just general presence in the meetings. It's very exciting. It's really good. And so the key point, um, particularly about these two challenges, is while they are geographically kind of focused, uh, as a result of that, we've got a cultural and a language focus as well, because I mean, how many languages are spoken across the African continent? Um, you know, a lot. And uh, we have a tendency and the very thrust of the sort of Eastern Town Hall was really to say, actually, not everyone speaks English. 
They might speak it, but not necessarily well. They don't necessarily have the same sort of Western ideals or cultural backgrounds that mean that they look at the world differently. And that's what these challenges are about, to open up the door, make people feel comfortable to come in and do that and work on them, as we all know, which is part of the Eastern Town Hall. So the challenge team uh, for this particular one, Grow East Asia, Grow at Cardano, is coming out of the Eastern Town Hall. Angela, Andreas, Lynn, and... Um, and who else is on that, Angela, on the challenge team? Me. Oh, and me. Yeah. Okay. So Tien. there's Tien is on there as well. So we've got, you know, so we're, I think yeah. we got the only challenge team which took the whole range of, because I think we have a maximum amount of seven. <laughs> and Eastern Tana is the only one who took all of them. <laughs> yeah, we have seven. <laughs> we have even more if you want. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, yeah, that's good to know, actually. Yeah. And, and it will be a slick operation, I tell you. <laughs> We've got Lynn cracking the whip on everyone. <laughs> um, and so, finally, probably the most important challenge of all of the challenges, and it happens everyone, is actually creating the challenges themselves. You know? um, this is how we sense what's going on. This is what we're going to look at for the next round, what we learn from. All right? uh, what do people think needs to go up and what should they? And I always think that you know, this is actually the most important one because if we um, overlook it, uh, and don't think about it and don't work on it, then, you know, the idea generation that is Catalyst can stall, right? And the key thing about the challenge setting one is to try and explore new types of challenges, new um, settings that get people thinking. And that's because the challenges themselves actually help us frame the proposals. They say, you know, go and solve this particular problem. With this is the constraint, go and figure it out. Try and come up with your solution or what you think it might be, uh, because we don't know. And it's the challenge settings that kind of set that framing of what's important and what the direction of where we're going. So we're all familiar with the challenge settings now. When they first came out, people weren't. Uh, they didn't know what's going on. But I think now what we need to do more than anything is really try and um, make these challenges robust. Uh, uh, uh. Oh, what we got going on there? That's weird. <laughs> so uh, I have a question. Yeah. Um, I know nobody knows and the decision hasn't been made. Um, what is the total amount of funding for fund nine and what is the expected amount of funding for fund 10, do you think? Fund nine, 16 million. Uh, one huge change is it's not anymore 16 million in US dollars worth in ADA. It's depends on the market. It's 16 million in US dollars if <laughs> ADA is very high, or 16 million ADA is if, yes, yeah. in all case. Just the one really important thing I think to mention, because actually a 16 million funding round now can say at least, um, yeah, okay, yeah, 16 million ADAs. And the 60 million ADAs maybe are worth on the market than on this actual moment, 9 million, for example, something like this, right? So for Fund 10, it isn't sure, but it was mentioned already in Fund 7 that uh, they won't double again from fund to fund like we did in the last year. Hmm. And I, I would, my personal opinion, that's good. I think we're at a good level where we can sort of start to bring, uh, start to improve on the proposals and stuff we're going through. And um, I like the idea that uh, the age or amount and the levels, I like that personally. So those are all the challenges um, for um, uh, fun, fun Nine. Yeah, on that. I'm, I'm sure that uh, ADA stuff, the ADA, the US dollar fluctuation thing has uh, probably caused a little bit of controversy, but I think it's actually a good thing. Um, on um, that, that sort of thing. So anyway, and I'm looking forward to the day as, as the treasurer of the Eastern Town Hall that our unit of account becomes ADA. <laughs> yeah, and we'll just do everything across like that. Makes life a lot easier. Right, so um, with that, uh, what I would say here is good proposals are driven by a clear vision of the future of what you want to, to create. Okay, and a thorough understanding of the challenges. 
um, proposal is being submitted into. Uh, that is my view. Always look and try and understand the challenges um, as you're actually writing those proposals and thinking about what you want to do. It's not the other way around. I've got a proposal. I'm going to try and shoehorn it into uh, the challenge. Look at the challenge. Ask what it's actually trying to, uh, what it's actually asking, uh, and then try and develop uh, a comp proposal that fits with your longer term vision of what you're actually trying to achieve um, and that in my mind makes a good proposal and with that I will uh, finish up on that any other sort of questions or anything else like that and I can stop sharing and uh, uh, go from there any other thoughts any other that was actually really helpful <laughs> yeah um clarifying in terms of next steps and uh we'll we'll go through and uh, you know we'll look at those proposals out of east africa and um, see see what we can do to help those sort of groups that are coming through um and hopefully uh in fund nine we'll get some good good results out of east africa which would be great great to see Okay, and uh, Ken, you know, Mawali and stuff like that can join on in and see what we can get going there. How, how's how's things going in terms of you teaching people Elm and things like that in Mawali? Uh, Mawali, um, I've I haven't been doing a lot of teaching recently. I've been working on some project ideas mostly. Um, I've got an idea for for collaborative ideation. So that's sort of what I'm working on right now for the most part. Okay. Yeah. And then how's things going on your end? How's things happening in Kenya at the moment? And your, your bits of your storybook and things like that that are, uh, you're working on? We can't hear you. Sorry, I muted myself. <laughs> I was just saying I can't uh, hear not you. Robert. Yeah. All <laughs> oh, right. I don't know if she's speaking or not. Right. One important thing to mention to the challenges and funding around that general uh, catalyst with the introduction introduction of the cooldown process, we have one catalyst funding round lasts four months now. So over one year year we have three funding rounds. So remember back. From three, six weeks for funding. <laughs> then we're overlapping even on whatever. Yeah. But yeah, really important to mention because uh, very often we have projects which calculate their budget over the time frame of funding rounds that they come back in the next one. So adjust it to four months. And if not, if you stick to the three months budget calculations, you will have a small gap. Okay. Right um, and uh, how's as things going, Yorama, everything, what, what's happening in um, Kadano for climate? How about giving us a little bit of an update on what's happening there? Hi. Um, no, I mean, so first of all, we got a lot of impact proposal funded, which was wonderful because we need to really check. I, I, you know, what's happened is a lot of time uh, the community or some people in the community of voters misconnect uh, more social related um, challenges with, in, with the technology development. And there's actually a lot of technology development uh, happening in uh, related to climate change products, right? Which are very big. So a lot, some of them were gotten funded and which is great. Uh, we kind of went into the last few weeks into an interesting process of um, uh, brain, um, brainstorming. Because you know we started the community nine months ago, it grew quite fast, and then we said, okay, what's what's now? So kind of a lot of people, new people came in, so we started to kind of stop and said, okay, let's bring again to the community the why, why we are doing it, what we want to do. So we had like three, four sessions about that, which was quite nice. And um, yeah, I mean it's uh, so that's kind of uh, where we are, and um, we we got funding in Fund Seven. 
we didn't even use yet the funding <laughs> as we got. I mean, although we are doing the things, we kind of had, we didn't, uh, we are trying to see how we can use it uh, in a creative way that actually create more engagement. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, uh, there was some, there was no consensus. I was actually forward to give it already and da, 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 but there was no consensus. So we kind of put it on hold. We got four proposals funded in fund seven. Uh, so quite, quite good. Uh, yeah, now it's uh, it's really a, a challenge. You now we create a stronger, growing, more engaged community, right? That create over more and more impact uh, within the blockchain as an opportunity for the blockchain. So yeah, this is a little bit where, where we are. If it's um, so exciting times and, and challenging, how, how we grow, you know, from just an idea that started and go to 250 people. What next, right? How we grow it next, how we connect better next, how we impact the blockchain to focus on uh, blockchain for good. Uh, again, as an opportunity. Um, and what started to happen actually a lot also another point, if we look on cross chain, so we are starting to collaborate with other communities of blockchain for good, uh, like positive blockchain. So uh, Crypto Valley in Switzerland and kind of we are becoming part of the discussion and on the table with other blockchains also, which is quite good as a community. So, one, so of the, one of the terms that has um, emerging quite stronger now in terms of, um, you know, we we're exploring things like I had a challenge up, I think in challenge four, challenge setting one to do social and environmental finance challenge. And I might put that up again at some point, but uh, um, the term that's getting used now is called regenerative finance. It's popping up all over the place now, just recently, which is by, uh, and it's shortened, shortened version uh, is uh, um, refi. So unfortunately, the, the mainstream have picked up on the term refi at, uh, John O'Connor's term for real finance isn't <laughs> is got co-opted by, but um, that's uh, an attempt to apply, like I said the earlier, um, the ideas of tokens as currencies, DeFi, the market-based mechanisms, and things like NFTs for social and environmental good. Um, and this is so massive. Uh, please do that in the next one. I mean, it's. It's massive and it's really needed. I mean, we know that there is tens, if not hundreds of billions of dollars claiming they are going for impact purposes, but nothing, they don't never get to the ground, right? So, so this type of models, if we can start having all this money, imagine Cardano leading that. I mean, we will have huge amount of money and institution coming into the ecosystem and actually have impact on the ground. Oh, well, that, uh, yeah, that's, that's certainly my hope. Yeah, go Felix. We just spoke the other day, we did evaluation on the carbon market. 70% of the money goes into the verification process. Only 20 to 30% of the money goes to the ground. Yes. I mean, it has to be, you know, 10 and 90, right? I mean, at least. And you speak yeah. about billions of dollars there. Yeah. That doesn't get to the ground. Yeah. And uh, huge opportunity. Okay, Felix, go. Okay. So you're on one question when you speak about the impact projects. Uh, one problem I think very often on impact, what not investments, projects, what not is really the documentation. Impact documentation and uh, let's say impact reports mostly happen in black boxes somehow. Nobody really has an access to it and can't, and we don't, we are not really able to measure impact on very often side. So how do you plan for your projects and for example to say, oh, okay, how can the community have a look at as well on saying, oh, okay. So this is, this is really the biggest problem up to now. You pinpoint the biggest problem of impact projects. Okay, how, so how people verify, right? And, and what's happened is that the verification models today doesn't work. Even if you look on, the, on the, um, the certification, like bio products and all of that, if you go to the ground, you understand the verification process doesn't work. And the verification process take a big part of the chunk. So it goes about putting the information in a transparent way out there to everyone, validated information. And then on top of that, you can build 
many applications. Right, so first of all, it's presenting the information in a transparent and, and open way to everyone. Um, that's number one, and then people can start making decisions. That's one. Second, we have actually a funded proposal, small one, that we work since fund seven on measurement and verification. And we try to evaluate how Catalyst projects are doing measurement and verification. And actually, no one is doing. Although, although many claims that they do impact, no one is actually even in power and you know, great companies like that, uh, they are thinking about it and they are developing that, but it's on progress. It's not embedded in the process. And the challenge there, I think we need to start with very simple actually, things that KPIs and not go to big frameworks of SDGs or that, which everyone get lost, but actually start with very simple KPIs of, okay, I, 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 what you are trying to do on the ground and, and how you are measuring that. And that will be some of the recommendation and tools, but it's a, it's a very complex issue uh, that, that enable up to now to do greenwashing, right? For most of the companies that kind of to, to say, hey, we paid hundred million dollars and we got the certification that we, <laughs> we mitigated our carbon, but nothing happened on the ground. So that's a lot of focus. Um, if it's answer your question, but it's a, comp it's a very complex problem because it's, it does no one answer, it's multi-layer. So probably verification for carbon is, is satellite-based technology will be a key one for that probably to give some kind of verification, advanced one. Um, so for the if uh, for tree planting projects and forest conservation projects, uh, others. I mean, we need to see the flow the money, where the money goes, and what's the impact. So if we see that only 20% or 30% get to the ground. Okay, where's the money, <laughs> right? So that's another example. Um, so all of this, we need to start tracking that. And that's the opportunity for Cardano, I think, to lead that. And to be really, it will attract a lot of governments, uh, big companies into that. I mean, we'll to cut off the bullshit, basically, through verification and uh, transparency tools. So um, I would add just, to this that's emphasize this idea of uh, doing small first uh, because actually to do impact related measurement is incredibly hard uh, not um, only because you're dealing with a lot of different factors uh, but it's just there's no uh, there's not a lot of wide knowledge about it wide knowledge and practice about how to integrate it into your projects and it's actually therefore really quite difficult to get your head around how to do that. Um, some of the best that I've, I know of at the moment in terms of trying to think about that is the impact management platform from a finance point of view, looking at how ESG related factors come into it. And they've got a whole lot of metrics and things like that. And so that's the core of the measurement angle for the retroactive financing work that I'm doing. Um, but ultimately, uh, it's down to people's skills, uh, how we go about doing those, standardizing um, how we approach it. Uh, the view that I'm taking at a lot of this is to start from the bottom and work upwards. And, and environmental and the other framing I, I put on this sort of lens is that uh, uh, impact or any sort of social or environmental change work is innovation broadly defined. It's uncertain. Um, we, it's stuff that has to be done locally, because you know, it's uh, highly contextual to a local environment, uh, which means that you've got to build skills up. And so this is the sort of thing, even like if you know, Angela, if we look at things like the um, the coffee scenario there, that's a good example of uh, do you go off and directly target the farmers, or do you target the advisors in between? You know? The advisors are the ones that transfer knowledge. There's a smaller set of them. Uh, you can start to put systems in place and, in terms of helping them. And those systems kind of manifest into the technology that you built. But you know, if you can figure out with a small group, first of all, what that system should be, uh, and then uh, start to move towards automation, uh, then you're better off uh, in the long run because it's more situated in what's actually happening. Um, yeah, yes. and, and you can see a good example of that in the in the one that's 31st century supply chain. It starts really boots on the ground, very deep uh, in Ghana with local teams, with an NGO expert as well, 
uh, and with a multinational that actually wants to create this transparency, which is a key, obviously. But all the work there is start from from the ground. I mean, and start recording everything from the ground and measuring it. And the idea is to build a model from that that can be duplicated. But it's a very complex problem to solve. Yeah, and um, you know, it takes time to do a concerted effort to actually yeah. work on it to to do things, which is actually somewhat incompatible, directly incompatible with the notions of uh, blockchains, where you've got to kind of get uh, the price matters. When you're going to do the drop, when you're going to do the drop, got to get the drop, got to get the price. That's sort the of thing. Um, whereas actually trying to build up capability and skill in local people that are at, at the cold face, so to speak, um, have real problems in their own context is a lot more difficult to do. Uh, and so you've got to give it a bit more space. So if there's anything that's the understanding that we have to start with is that it is actually really hard to do impact related work. Just look at trying to measure the impact and performance of individual projects or proposals within um, uh, Catalyst itself. It's actually quite hard you know, and to do it. So imagine trying to do that in places uh, that are dealing with the environment and stuff. And um, your own spot on a book there from um, Scott, was it? This is Scott's one, isn't it? Um, Beyond Certification, the Rorted Certification. In, uh, um, and how do we move beyond that? Okay. So, um, yeah, this is this is a, a topic near and dear to my heart, Felix, and I'm trying, I'm avoiding to try and uh, actually talk about it because I could go on for hours and uh, I've already done the monologue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's great because don't, don't go into the now multi-layer accounting, right? Which yes, is so yeah, crucial. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and uh, yeah, I, I want to keep you guys all sort of slightly awake, not going <laughs> <through. laughs> on that sort of there. Uh, but yes. Multi, multi layer accounting can go into actually the, the legal part, maybe somehow. Um, that can be a revolution uh, bringing that in. Uh, um, well, yeah, this is, um, yeah, okay. And you probably heard this from Joe as well. The idea of multi capital accounting um, is uh, really, really actually. I am really still quite surprised so, because Cardano, in my understand, uh, from what I understand uh, still, is the only one that actually treats value as a vector. That means what I mean by that is it actually accounts for things in multiple capitals at the bookkeeping layer. Um, all others don't. And that's because we've got this idea of um, uh, an output as a bundle of tokens of different from different policies and we can transfer those all in one group and that's the basis for multi-capital accounting because it's the base level blockchain um, bookkeeping there uh, so you know and tokens can largely represent anything and so as a result of that you can represent tokens that represent a particular dimension of what you're trying to do it could be say human well-being it could be uh, environmental well-being, could, which is often described in terms of carbon credits. You know, and, uh, but you can reflect all sorts of different things through tokens. And because you've got a blockchain bookkeeping system that deals natively with um, multiple assets in one transfer, uh, then uh, you've got the basis for doing multi capital accounting. And I'm seriously trying to avoid talking about that. <laughs> Yeah, anymore but that's that's the just Cardano is the only one that actually well uh only one that fully supports that as I understand I haven't properly looked at Ergo or some of the other UTXO extended UTXO chains um but they should also do it yeah and so it's good opportunity there so, um, so in, the, in Angela, that book that um, Joram's put on there, Beyond Certification, it's an open access one. You might want to have a look at that as well, because that's related to the coffee stuff. How can uh, certification, um, so you've got one thing, which is collecting the information about the activities that have been done. You've got to say where and when and how, who did it, uh, are important things. The who did it is an identity one about individuals, the where is an identity about place, 
Um, so again, this is where things like digital identity components of the self-sovereign stuff come to play, especially the DID framework. Um, and that starts to build in veracity into the information that you're collecting over time. And um, that creates a web of facts that machines are very, very good at uh, crunching, as in like going through indexing, working out what's going on and coming up with some sort of figure, especially if they've got, uh, can trust those bits of information that's coming through. Uh, there are privacy implications in collecting lots of information. So this is where things like zero knowledge proofs and stuff like that could be rather useful. Um, I'm not talking about um, you know, other aspects which try to hide information. You know, this is about trying to say um, something was done uh, and we can prove that something was done, um, but we don't have to reveal what was done. Uh, and that's actually quite a useful um, piece of uh, technology that can be applied here. Uh, and through building up those sort of facts and stuff, people can start to build trust in the information that's coming through. All right. If, uh, and Yoram, please um, push back on this or add to it or support it, whatever, is largely if we can actually improve the um, reporting standards, the impact measurement, the so-called ESG around a lot of factors, uh, capital can more easily be deployed to actually address those sort of problems. Uh, because that's the biggest problem within the impact finance space at the moment is uh, no one really knows whether it's actually creating an impact or not. Yeah, I mean, this is, again, this is the biggest problem. I mean, even on the microfinance industry, $40 billion industry, which is targeted for impact, what's the impact on the ground? No one knows, right? Except of the banks makes an interest. What's the actual entrepreneurs on the ground that became much better off? Very few, apparently. So, I mean, this is really a key, this tracking information. And this book, by the way, was written by Scott. So Scott has 20 years experience of working on agricultural supply chains. And he used to be in a government body for um, certification for palm oil. It used to be a big issue, right, palm oil 10 years ago. And he used to, so it was a big, all the big multinationals were part of it. Everyone was part of it. And then he used to go to companies on the ground that signed the agreement and they signed the agreement and in the back you see, <laughs> you see the big machine to cut the wood. <laughs> so, I mean, is that okay? I mean, what, it doesn't make sense, right? And then he started, he went out to the, he worked in an NGO called Earthworm for the Forest Trust before, and he just went out from this organization. Uh, and he started to work, um, you know, how you build trust. Before the blockchain area, how you build trust, how you bring it, how you build it from the ground, the values, how you enumerate accordingly the people that actually do the work on the ground, that they don't, uh, if they keep nature, for example, right? All of these issues uh, came already then, and I think the blockchain is an opportunity to put it on the blockchain. And I believe once you put the transparency, then, then we can make the choices. Then we can say, hey, we want to support this or not, but at least we, a multinational can say a decision based on full transparent information, right? And then the customer decide if they want to buy from this multinational or not, but that's another. But then, so that's kind of the, um, the shift that need to be moved to, to, to move to this uh, area. One of the things I'll uh, just add at the moment is um, just, again, a bit of experience here. Most of my time at the moment is um, uh, spent trying to help people bridge uh, a number of things. My world that I live in today, the impact uh, measurement and reporting and finance world, which is another one, and this weird thing over here called a blockchain. Um, and it's not just a blockchain in the case of Kadana, it's also a catalyst because it's like, what? You got a group of people from all over the world coming together and they can get finance for their projects? Nah, it doesn't work. What, what do you mean? <laughs> um, so the combination of all those sort of things make it really, really hard. Uh, so uh, a lot of my time has been just, has been for the last six, seven years, just really helping people bridge that gap and getting them used to the ideas and learning, so. Um, yeah, so we have, a, we have a meetup over coming up, not this week, next week, in two weeks we'll do it. Maybe we'll do it in an hour that is good for you also. <laughs> but we try to reach out, yeah, I'm sorry for that. I mean, 
I think this one is 7 p.m. Europe time, so it might fit. But um, to reach out to external communities, interests in impact people, impact companies, and impact organizations, and connect them to the basically to Cardano. Hmm. So that's uh, really a call for outside through examples or use cases, and quite a cool one. Yeah. yeah. And the big thing here is trying to get. Um, I talk a lot about the need to uh, collaborate and coordinate activities. One of the big things with certainly the case here in New Zealand, there's a lot of the NGOs that are trying to do social environmental good are actually thrown into a competitive funding kind of situation where they're disincentivized to actually collaborate. And the problem with things like climate and social change is they're actually large complex problems that require coordination and collaboration across different types of organizations, across different points of view. Um, so oddly, um, the sort of work that's happening within Catalyst in terms of trying how we go about and do funding and work on things are actually very similar sort of tools that might be needed to actually solve uh, environmental and social problems as well, more broadly. Um, yeah, and I laugh on that because everyone said that we need collaboration, we need collaboration, but no one is willing to collaborate. I mean, everyone is, <laughs> we need collaboration, but you start, right, or somehow, in, I mean, in the bigger scope, because it's big, it's big issues, you too. I mean, it's not, uh, I mean, agriculture, supply chains, and so on, it's very challenging issues, so, because it's not, yeah, anyway, it's complex, yeah, so, yeah, it gets how we create this collaboration, yeah. yeah. Um, so, one with, with that. Sorry, go to Alex, quickly. Yeah. I think one of the main problems is also what we see really hardly in Catalyst, and it's great to collaborate and all, but collaboration is not sustainable yet. It's not rentable. It's not lucrative. There isn't yet a financial sustainability and security which allows you to show on a long time frame, hey, to engage in a shit ton of projects, to collaborate, to help wherever and whenever you can. This mostly left you behind with burnout. <laughs> <laughs> and very empty pockets, <laughs> but with an amazing developed and uh, delivered impact, right? And this is a huge problem. I think it's not yet sustainable, and we, and this really impacts a lot of stuff. I think. Yeah, yeah, it is. That's quite. That's a tricky situation on the, at the moment as I try to bring on more people and stuff like that. Uh, and and if, in effect, you know, we're trying to balance a whole lot of different things out. And uh, but yeah, hopefully we'll get there. Uh, anyway, we have to uh, finish up because um, we've only got one license on our Zoom account. So we've got another session coming up in about 10 minutes. Uh, so uh, we have to finish up. We've got a challenge thing, I think. Is that right? To, um, that Lynn has organized? Yes. Uh, so I promised Lynn that I'd give him at least 10 minutes to the hour so he could uh, switch off and go over and set everything up. So with that... Uh, we're going to finish slightly earlier than usual. And thank you very much for coming along. It's lovely to see all your faces again. Uh, Ken, haven't seen it for a while. Please make sure you come back and we'll dive into more what you're doing in Moali. And it's lovely to see you, Felix, and your own again. I myself have been a bit head down and quiet and so I just do these sort of things at the moment because getting up at 5am in the morning Yoram is a non-starter for me <laughs> because mm. there's no way that I will function for the rest of the day and also have meetings in the evening uh, which tend to yeah. happen so of if it can course. be 7am uh, New Zealand time then I'm in but uh, anything earlier than but that. We need, we need to duplicate it into the other time zones as well so that's yeah. something uh, need to be yeah. done. Yeah. Um, so with that, uh, Lynn is hovering around and he's saying, finish up, people, because I've got to get organized. <laughs> um, and so lovely to see you all. And thanks for coming along. And uh, we'll see you for uh, see you next time around. All the best. Thank you. Ka kite anō. Uh, and I'll leave it.